name is Sharon Kelly. I was originally born in Baltimore, Maryland, and I am a transgendered woman. When I was three years old, I remember looking in the mirror and I thought I had a long, let's say a bob, for instance. I thought I had long hair, but a year later, I found out that I was born a boy. And that kind of made me feel sad because that's not who I am. Um, and every time that I would try to wear clothes or girl clothes that I would try to pretend to wear makeup, I would be told to take these things off, especially for my dad because he doesn't believe in dressing up as gay or lesbian or being the other gender, the opposite gender. It's really um, a very individual experience for each person. Uh, we certainly know of people who have identified very, very early at age two, three, four years old. Um, they've known that they were transgender. And for some people, you know, they really are kind of coming um, into that identity much later in life. Every time I try to mention girly things or try to mention that I'm his daughter, he would um, just turn my back, turn his back on that. I just kind of felt hurt. And um, I was kind of afraid to express myself as who I am. And by the time I told him that I was his daughter, he didn't want to hear it. He just thought that it was wrong to change my gender. But I tried to ex explain to him that I'm born just who I am, but he kept shutting me off and he kept talking over me. I just felt it was disrespectful. Typically for transgender children, um, a huge barrier can be able, you know, just having the ability to communicate to um, guardians about their identity. A lot of children are shamed or silenced um, when trying to articulate who they are and um, that can cause a lot of shame and also prolongs um, being in the closet, really. Um, later on in life, being transgender just exacerbates any other type of oppression that somebody might be facing. My mom understood that I've always wanted to wear a skirt and always wanted to wear girly clothes. I remember getting into her makeup too, and she didn't want me to do that. I even tried to tell my mom that I've always wanted to be myself as Sharon, but I didn't talk as much because I had autism. I remember being the shy one and the quiet one and I just never said a word. So all my life, all my years through elementary through high, I went to school as Sean or as in Victor. And I just... Um, I think that there are a number of um, myths surrounding people who are transgender. I think one of the uh, biggest myths that often makes people feel very uncomfortable is that people who are transgender are mentally ill. And we know that that is not true. We know that um, being transgender is not a mental illness. It was hard for me to make friends. Um, I mean, I only had a couple acquaintances that understood what I was going through, but nothing much happened after that extra year ended. Um, so it was more like a negative outcome. Media has not done transgender individuals, particularly transgender women, uh, any favors. Um, we see, you know, this idea that, um, you know, transgender women are trying to trick people is a, you know, kind of common thing that again plays out in a lot of popular movies and is a, a narrative that we hear spread on social media. Of course, um, you know, Talking about bathrooms has become such a hot thing. You know, people are discussing bathrooms all the time and bathroom access. And I think that that narrative was really damaging um, to so many transgender people because they were hearing this idea that, that you know, they were being equated to, to predators. Um, and I think that that's, you know, those are the things that when we think about the stigma, a lot of the stigma is really, I mean, a lot of it is really rooted in, you know, kind of the pervasive misogynistic attitudes of our society. But beyond that, it's rooted in the fact that so many people are not aware of, they don't know that they've ever known a transgender person. They don't know that you know, the, 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 they're very likely to have encountered somebody who is transgender and they 
possibly didn't even know. You know, people always think that they will be able to tell um, or think that there's something, you know, really, you know, inherently wrong with somebody who's transgender, which is has been proven time and time again um, by science and all major medical organizations to be false. Um, I would not say that I chose to be this way. I was born a female inside, but the only thing that I the only negative thing is that I was born in the wrong gender. And I'm like, I don't belong in this body. I need out of it. And so um, I have been asked if I'm, ever, if I'm ever going to get hormones. And I was like, someday, if the insurance could cover it or if I had the money for it. When somebody finds out you're trans, it's kind of the only thing they see. And it's the only thing they're judging you by. And they're making those judgments based on things, based on things like reporting in the news that uh, uh, doesn't do its best to be fair and accurate or representations in media, which are um, often built on, on shaming transgender people or painting them as pathetic or painting them as villainous. Um, and you never know that. It's why it's, it's, uh, why it is so nice to have that support network and to have a community that you can go to because you know that that's not necessarily going to happen uh, in the same way that it does with the general public. There is a guarded, there's, there's a level of self-protection you have to have in almost any communication um, with somebody who knows you're trans mm. simply because, not because everyone's evil and everyone's out to get trans people, but you don't know. And it's, it can be, that can be something that's very hard to assess. And it can be very damaging when somebody, whether that's your employer or a doctor or your family, uh, your parents, it can be extremely harmful to then have those people, to, to discover that those people actually um, care about you up to a certain point. They might actually want to associate different levels of shame with something that is really you just trying to live your authentic self insurance companies don't really cover uh, hormone therapy or um, various gender confirmation surgeries and that's you know that's an issue but also can you afford it even if the insurance covers part of it can you find an affirming doctor to begin with can you get a uh, mental health care professional to sign a letter saying that you're stable enough to undergo these um, procedures so there's a lot there's a lot of what we call medical gatekeeping um, against transgender people um, and a lot of in a lot of ways and often someone's mental instability is being caused by an extreme amount of dysphoria and anxiety surrounding their um, gender identity and their gender dysphoria and so they can't get through you know talking to a therapist and getting cleared for anything because they're not meeting these standpoints whereas you know we really know that the hormone therapy in itself could alleviate quite a lot of that so a therapist might say for example well you seem dead set on this idea of gender transition, but we might like to just experiment with four or five different antidepressants and, and see how you respond to those. Mm -hmm. uh, even though, you know, you, your, your own mind and, and your own body are, are telling you what you need. Um, and the other uh, aspect of, of, of a barrier to healthcare is transgender people also face inordinate barriers to just standard healthcare that has nothing to do with their transition. There's something in the trans community known as broken arm syndrome, where if you show up to an ER and you have a broken arm, uh, a doctor might offer the idea of, oh, well, I can't treat you because you're going through hormone therapy and I don't know how this could be affecting this particular issue. And I've spoken with doctors who've said that that is inordinately common, um, as well as is harassment, as well as is doctors making jokes um, about transgender patients. And again, even just for, like if you're a trans and diabetic, you might get told, well, oh, your transition uh, might be affecting your diabetes when really there's almost no connection between the two. And um, doctors often don't take it as their responsibility to learn and understand what trans-related care has to do and how it affects people so they tend to just dump a ton of problems into that bucket and say, I don't want to deal with it um, because it has to do with trans-related care. And that ends up denying trans people service. When I think of um, me being transgender, 
I feel as though I don't belong in this body. This body belongs to somebody else. And I felt as though God made the wrong decision to put me in this hell hole. I just, I just felt like it just wasn't for me. So I think when people ask that, they're really focused on medical transition and body, and I've heard the word like mutilate kind of, mm. you know, often connected to those sentiments. And I think it's just a, a major lack of understanding. I think if people asking those questions had to live in a body that just felt so incongruent, um, that they would understand. And it's the kind of thing that you just can't possibly understand unless, unless you're living it. And, you know, choose also doesn't feel right to me. I, I did not choose this. It is the only option I could have spent the last two years of my life medically transitioning or I could be dead because it is a roadblock. It's, it's all encompassing anxiety and depression. And if I had to continue to live in my body that way, um, then I didn't want to continue to live. I think it's so important that, you know, a transgender person has some kind of support, some kind of place to connect. So sometimes that looks like an LGBT community center. Um, sometimes that looks like online support. And there are huge online support groups, um, you know, on every social media platform that are really geared towards helping transgender people uh, be able to talk about their lived experience and share their lived experience. So, you know, regardless of, you know, friends, family, you know, whatever's happening in the individual's life, seeking out support and having support through, um, especially in these early days of, uh, of a medical transition or a social transition, I think it's pretty paramount. Um, and, you know, and additionally from there, that's, you know, again, going to be very individual. So a person could, could you know, opt to maybe have um, surgeries and certainly, and again, more often than not, opt not to. I'm somebody who, like, uh, I wouldn't even get a tattoo um, because I'm afraid I'll change my mind immediately thereafter. <laughs> uh, so, so let that speak to the degree of confidence I had um, that this is what was right for me. And I, I generally have seen anything medical that I've done as corrective, if that makes sense. Mm. Same. That's a really fantastic way to put it. It's corrective. It's not elective. Transgender people are significantly more likely to be homeless. They are significantly more likely to commit suicide. They are significantly more likely to face rampant unemployment or job discrimination. They are more likely to experience intimate partner violence. Uh, they are more likely to experience assault, sexual assault, rape. Um, I would, ex yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's very much an across the board level of societal oppression that trans people face. It's why spaces like this, it's why community is so important. Uh, not just because you can then kind of see yourself in other people because you then have that kind of safety. removal and freedom, but also safety that there are, are real numbers. And, and I know for a lot of trans people that I've worked here at the center or elsewhere, uh, a big thing is, is just like, let's let's go get a drink. Like, let's go out to dinner. And, and, and just that notion of feeling safe moving through the world because there's there's more than one of us. Um, or, or merely just having somebody to go with. People come out as transgender at, at all different stages of life. Mm -hmm. um, the narrative is really like everyone knows when they're a baby. Mm -hmm. That's true for a lot of people. It's not true for everybody because sometimes you just don't have the language or you just don't connect those pieces until you're older. I know people who come out in their 70s. Um, but for parents who are just becoming privy to the fact that their child is transgender, um, I think it's just important that you're listening to your child. Children do know who they are and they do know what's best for them. Um, I think we we really wrap ourselves up and that kids just don't know, they just don't know, but people inherently know who they are and you have to listen, you have to lean in, you know, and, and do what's best for them. Because puberty under the influence of a hormone that you're not, you know, like for me, I went, I went through puberty under the influence of estrogen and that's been uh, a little traumatic for me. <laughs> um, at this stage in life. And so I think it's really important that the earlier you can affirm your child, um, the better. And, and often in parent circles, parents of transgender um, kids, what they really say to parents just coming on board to this is, you can 
affirm your child and change name and pronouns and do whatever they're asking you to do and lean into that or you can plan a funeral because statistically that's just what we know happens i think a lot of people say well what if it's a phase um and if it's a phase so what kids have phases um roll with it <laughs> see yeah. see how it goes uh there are certainly and and i think there's a lot of judgment put on parents who uh say put a young child on puberty blockers or allow their their teenager to begin transition um because it seems like a decision that the parent is just making let the child run free but generally these decisions are made with teams of doctors they're made with therapists uh this is not um this is not a cult this is not some, <laughs> some some crazy delusion that that modern life is bringing to your door this is what we know through the science this is what what, what uh, the medical field knows about the trans experience um, and there's not a ton of debate about it. We run three groups um, a week that are just for anybody in the LGBT community and one group a week that's specifically for transgender, for people who identify as transgender, gender non-conforming or, you know, or questioning. And I watch on Wednesday nights, that's our high school group. And I watch the high schoolers come in and the first time they come, um, this group of predominantly, while it is open to anybody in the LGBT community, it's about 80% people who identify as transgender. And I see the first time they come, and they're oftentimes timid and reserved, and they you know, don't know anybody yet, and they're kind of feeling it out. And then we see them you know, three, four you know, groups later, and they're great, and they're making great friends, and they're really out and feeling affirmed in their identities, uh, feeling affirmed in the pronouns that they're using, the names that they're using. And, and it's been amazing to see how many of these youth are able to take that and then carry that throughout the week when oftentimes they do go home to a household that is not affirming or a school that is not affirming uh, or the regular life uh, that's not affirming. So having that kind of like lifeline to each other too and a quite, literally, quite literal lifeline to each other throughout the week I think is so beneficial too. Um, you know, being able to reach out to other people and discuss things that may be coming up in school or um, you know, just how they're feeling. Um, we know that when we talk about things like the suicide rate for transgender people being astronomically disproportionately high compared to the general population, we know that, you know, again, going back to reiterate that being transgender is not a mental illness, but being transgender in a society that tells you you're a second class citizen at best all the time really takes a huge toll on people. And, and our youth are experiencing that, and our young people are experiencing that. Uh, they're really feeling oftentimes very, um, you know, just just really struggling with that. And so I think having that support is a, such a vital component and many studies have confirmed that as well. I don't want people to think that um, I just want to wear these clothes just because I want to and because I'm gay. I'm not gay. I am a woman who is trapped in a wrong body. Because we are talking so much about transgender identities right now, this really is, is something that is coming into public consciousness. A lot of people are thinking that it's a trend. They're thinking it's something that people are doing because they want to, you know, be cool, counterculture, whatever. So typically when we hear the, the talk around why are you choosing this, it's coming from people who think that a person who's transgender uh, is, is trying to be part of the new it thing to do. Um, one of the things we really know is that's not the case at all. The reason why we're seeing more transgender people now than we ever have before is because people have access to knowledge now. They have access to things like the internet, and again, those support groups I spoke of. Um, you know, they have access to figuring out their identities much earlier and connecting with people who identify in a similar way. And so the fact that they're able to do that means that they're able to accurately describe who they are and how they feel. There were you know, just as many transgender people 50, 100, 200 years ago, they just didn't even know how to begin to explain what they were feeling. Um, maybe they felt a deep sense of dissatisfaction with their body, um, which would be the gender dysphoria, um, or, or something along those lines, but they never knew how to explain that. Now, in an age of social media, we do see people you know, being able to explain that. So we know that this is not a choice. This is something that people are feeling, again, oftentimes very early in life. Um, and we know that this is something that people are able to accurately describe now because they do have more access to information. And you know, they say the number has doubled, the number of people identifying as transgender in America has doubled in five years. And I think this is the tip of the iceberg. I think as more and more people are able to more accurately identify um, you know, who they are, um, we'll see many, many more people coming out as transgender. And, and so um, this is certainly a very exciting time because we are, you know, as a movement, um, 
there have been a lot of great strides, but it's also with that comes a lot of pushback and a lot of misinformation as well.